Hong Ui. I'm from Microsoft. Um, so today I'm just going to be talking about this recommender algorithm that was uh, developed in-house by the guys at Redmond. Okay. Um, so just a, an outline of the talk. Um, so the, the um, algorithm is called SAR, stands for Smart Adaptive Recommendations. I think originally it was like simple uh, algorithm for recommendations, but we, we decided we needed a sexier acronym for, than that. So we called it Smart Adaptive Recommendations instead, which makes it sound like it's doing something really good. Um, so I'll go through the, the, the desc uh, description of the algo. It's actually, you know, quite uh, neat. It's very simple, um, but does the job. And time permits, I will sort of go into a, a demo showing you like the various implementations that are available. There's one on the cloud in Azure, and there's also a standalone implementation. And obviously, it's all in R since this is, a, this is an R conference. Okay. Um, okay. So basically, what is a recommender? First of all, if you don't know what a recommender algorithm is, it's like if you go to say Amazon or uh, um, JB Hi-Fi or something, you know, it'll, if you, it'll say people who bought X also bought XYZ or, you know, people who liked this movie also like XYZ, that kind of thing. So smart adaptive recommendations, it's basically a collaborative filtering recommender uh, based on practical heuristics and experience. So if you don't know what that means, collaborative filtering means that you use the, um, the data from multiple users um, to make a recommendation for a specific user. So maybe if like, lots of different people uh, liked um, this particular movie, you might recommend that um, as, as a very simplified principle. Or you might say if this person likes this particular movie and all these other people also like this movie and liked um, another movie, then you recommend this other movie as well. Um, so SAR is um, it's similar in spirit to something like market basket or association rules analysis. Um, how many people here have, have worked with recommender algorithms and, you know, okay, so a couple, a few. So you may be familiar with like, algor algorithms that use like matrix factorization, um, you know, try to uh, determine latent factors that describe how people, uh, what people like. This doesn't do any of that. It's, it's more purely transaction-based. So uh, how many people bought a, a particular item as opposed to how many people, you know, liked a particular item? It's all based on predicting what you will buy, uh, not what you like. In practice, you know, this is often the more uh, salient, I guess, problem that's of interest to the business. Um, a couple of things that we were looking for was to get like transparent results. You know, you want something that you can really explain to the customer so they know what's going on. They feel that they can have confidence in it. You know, so just saying something like, you know, trust me, I'm a statistician doesn't really work. Or maybe trust me, I'm a data scientist doesn't really work. And also trust me, I'm from Microsoft also doesn't work. <laughs> um, don't ask me how I know. Um, yeah, so it's transparent, you know, you can literally explain it in a few minutes. Um, and it's also fa fairly fast because you're not doing these complex, you know, uh, factorizations. Um, you know, you can get results out in just a few minutes, even on fairly large data sets. Okay. So I'll give a quick sketch of the algorithm, um, uh, which involves just two main entities. And essentially, you just combine them to get recommendations. So the first main entity is what's called the similarity matrix, and this is just based on what's called, you know, co-occurrences. How many people uh, bought item I and item J? So you've got this matrix, so this says, you know, you might have five people who bought item one, um, three people who bought item one and item two, uh, four people who bought item one and item three, and so on. So it's all based on counts of transactions. And you know um, you can transform this to other matrices, uh, other metrics based on counts. You know things like uh, a jacquard uh, similarity metric or lift or so on. Uh, one feature is that this matrix will typically be sparse when the number of items is large. I'll you know uh, touch on that later on. The other main entity is what's called the user item affinity matrix, and this you know just measures like in a sense the strength of the relationship of a given user with a given item. And it's just a weighted cross tab of transaction counts. So like, you know, user one maybe bought or saw uh, item one five times, 
uh, bought or saw item two, three times, and so on. Uh, a nice feature is that the weights, you know, it's not just a cross tab, it's a weighted cross tab, and the weights are just an exponential decay term. So this allows you to, um, you know, capture changing patterns of behavior. So maybe, for example, um, this movie was really popular five years ago, but it's completely dropped off the radar since then. Or, you know, fidget spinners are big now, but no one will know what they are in 10 years' time, or pet rocks, or whatever. You know, so you can basically just downweight stuff that's earlier without necessarily having to throw it away altogether. Um, if you have different types of transactions, so for example, if uh, most of the stuff we do is like for online stores, you might have like buy transactions, view, uh, cancel, add to cart, and so on. You can apply different like multiplicative weights to them as well. So buy might be worth 10, a view is one, a cancel is minus one, that kind of thing. And another key feature, obviously, is, is that this is going to be sparse. Um, you know, you may have like 10,000 types of uh, items in your catalog, but a particular user is not going to buy all 10,000. Okay? And when you get recommendations, to get a recommendation, all you essentially do is just, you, do, you just multiply those two entities together. So given a column, affinity vector, and a similarity matrix, the vector of recommendation scores for a user is just R equals S times A. Okay, so um, this gives you a vector of scores and you just sort that and return the top 10 or top five or top however many. And you can exclude the scene items if you want. So if you want to recommend um, items or recommend movies, you know, if this, someone has already seen Star Wars, you don't want to recommend it again, you can do that as well. Okay. It turns out that this bit uh, the last bit, you know, the sorting and excluding, is actually the bulk of the computational work. Once you've uh, uh, um, used smart tricks like RCPP, I see Dirk has just turned up. Okay. Yeah, so just uh, as a quick ex example, oops, um, your similarity matrix from before, affinity vector for, for a particular user, you just multiply them together to get these scores. Okay, so for example, um, you know, your item number two, that's just five times three, or oh sorry, three times five by plus four times three plus three times 2.5 and so on. Okay, and, you, and then you just sort them. Uh, if you don't want to recommend items that user has already seen, um, the vector of scores then just, or recommendations then just becomes that. Okay, so how would you explain this? So for example, if someone wants to know, well, why is this, uh, why is, for example, um, item number three second highest on the list? Well, you can say, well, item number three, you know, has a high affinity with items number one and number uh, and number two. Okay. Item number one has a strong affinity for this user. Item number two has a strong affinity for this user, and that's why this score is so high. Conversely, why is item number five such a low score? Well, item number five you know, has a low affinity for items one, two, and three. And that's why this guy has a low score on that. Oh, sorry, low similarity. Okay, so you recommend items that are similar to what this guy has bought. Um, or recommend items that were bought by people that, who bought the same items as this used them. Okay. So contrast that, for example, with uh, latent factors and matrix factorization, we end up with like um, factors which may be um, uninterpretable and the best you can do is like plot them on some kind of um, um, uh, chart you know, and say well these particular movies all cluster together and these other movies all cluster together so in some vague way you know you can say they are similar. Okay. So benefits and drawbacks so first of all this is actually very fast there's no matrix factorization involved um, the matrix multiplication is actually still a bit slow but thanks to taking advantage of something like RCPP Armadillo, uh, which was just developed by, you know, guys just across the road at Griffith University, I, sh I should mention. A shout out to Conrad at uh, Data61. You know, um, you, that is actually very fast. It doesn't need item or user features. So this means it's actually applicable to a very wide range of data sets, a very wide range of problems. You know, um, you may have a data set, you want to get recommendations, but, you know, you don't have ratings. Or maybe you might have um, uh, features for uh, these items, but they're in a separate database, and you have to do some costly process of joining. 
For this, all you really need is a table of transactions, you know, who bought what. Predictions are explainable, as I mentioned before. Oops, you can handle changing behavior. Um, one thing which I uh, particularly like is that it's also, because it doesn't use ratings, it's robust to subjective issues to do with ratings, things like, you know, brigading, where something goes viral on Reddit or wherever, and you get hordes of people coming in to downvote it. So, you know, maybe there's some scandal or whatever. Um, less um, controversially, you know, things like, um, how many people here have ever rated something that, you know, they got from Uber or from Deliveroo or wherever? Okay, quite a few. How many of you have done this more than, say, five times? Okay. Three people. So, you know, um, you might have a data set with, like, 10,000 items and maybe a million users, and out of that, you may have, like, 1,000 people who regularly rate. So, you know, um, what looks like a big data set may not be that big. Um, the drawbacks, and this is where I show I really should not be in sales, you know, um, for drawbacks, your similarity matrix is order m squared, where m is the number of items, so this can quickly become very large. Sparse matrices do help with this, and again, this is where RCPP armadillo was very useful. Um, doesn't exploit item or user features, so, you know, if you do have these features and you have a model that can use them properly, then, you know, they, that can give you a better result. Uh, it's not based on any rigorous theoretical model, um, if that floats your boat. Um, and also, it doesn't really output a preference measure. All it says is, here are the things this, part this person is going to buy. Um, it doesn't say anything about what other things this person is going to like, which means that, you know, you can't really use measures like RMSE. Um, you can't, it's hard to compare to methods that, you know, are based on, rate, on rankings, on ratings. Okay. Um, but here's a quick performance example. So um, we were doing some uh, testing of this on like the movie lens data, which is available freely. Um, your precision and recall for our funky SAR algorithm is actually, it turns out to be a lot higher than for ALS, which is just the um, impl implementation in uh, Spark MLlib. Um, but although I should mention, this testing regimen is a bit different. We are training on earlier transactions and then trying to predict which movies a, a user will watch um, later on. So that's not really the same thing as what, uh, you know, ALS is designed for. We're not trying to predict ratings. We're not trying to say, here are some movies this guy liked, and there's some other movies, which one will he like? That's, not, that's a different question. Okay? But at least... Uh, we, we believe that the question we're asking is going to be more relevant to more customers. You know, it's actually saying, what, was, what is this guy going to spend money on? Okay. So in terms of implementation, um, uh, there's an implementation in the cloud, in Azure, so you can spend money on us without knowing it. Um, so there's a GitHub repo that gives you the um, front end and the documentation. It goes through a lot of detail, which I've left out. Um, the backend runs on a Azure web app, talks to the client via REST. Everything is saved in blob storage. The R implementation, which I will try to give a quick demo of as well, it provides an interface to Azure uh, via uh, some supplementary packages for talking to Azure called Azure RMR and Azure Store. Azure RMR is basically an interface to resource manager. And there's also a standalone implementation using RCPP Armadillo, using RCPP Parallel. Uh, which um, lets you get to grips with the model, do experimentation, and so on. Uh, it's uh, obviously a lot faster to come to grips with it if it's all on your laptop. Okay, all open source under MIT. Uh, quick recommendation, uh, acknowledgement slide, all the people who worked on this before me. Uh, many of them are no longer Microsoft, which is a complete co coincidence. Okay, so um, here is Visual Studio RTBS. I'll quickly show you how this works. Okay, just load up some packages, uh, load up some sample data. This is not particularly big, so I'm not going to be spending uh, five minutes loading stuff in. Okay, so it's just like some quick uh, catalog data, which is, again, on the GitHub repo. Uh, you've got your user IDs, item IDs, and a timestamp. I'll load in my Azure credentials. So this is an... Um, R6 object that describes my uh, resource manager session. Okay, this is an R6 object that describes my subscription. If you haven't used Azure, a subscription is basically 
like, you know, who pays for the money. This particular subscription is on Satya's tab. Um, I will now just get the recommender service backend, which I created before. So this bit here I created. That takes maybe a couple of minutes to run. I'm just going to load it up. Okay. I will now generate a client front end from that back end. So this is another R6 object. This doesn't use resource manager, so this is what you would use to talk to the front end. Um, I will upload a data set to store blob storage. I will train a model. This will probably take about half a minute, of which 29 minutes is Azure faffing around. Uh, 20 seconds, sorry, is Azure faffing around. I think it will tell me that it only took like two seconds or whatever to train the model and the other 39, 29 seconds was just uh, as you're thinking about it. There you go. So training duration, the longest two seconds I've ever experienced. Okay, so that is my model. Okay, um, I can get some predictions. So here are some items that are very similar to, a, to this particular item. I can get predictions for a particular user. So this is just a, a, a random user in the data set. Here are the recommendations for that user. Okay, now if I want to do that all standalone, good. Um, the function is just called SAR. It's just using S3. Uh, because I think S4 is way too much of a pain to work with. Um, again, the, the functions are very similar. You have item predict and user predict to get the predictions for a particular item or personalized recommendations for a particular user. Okay, so I think that is that. Any questions? Okay, so I think you're saying what happens, uh, can you avoid just recommending the most popular items by default? Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess first of all, if it's the most popular, then this guy might have already bought it and you can just exclude the seen items that way. Um, if he hasn't bought it, well then, you know, what's the harm in recommending something that everyone likes, I guess? There might be a cost involved in the actual recommendation. Uh, a cost involved in the recommendation? Well, this, uh, um, in that case, this is a very simple model, and you know there are very there's very little friction involved in getting the model up and running. So I think that also helps there. Okay. All right. I think that's all we have time for. So uh, thank okay. you.